Happy Sunshine Family. Welcome back to the Lunacy Channel. It's been quite a day, a lot of things going on, and I can just feel a whole lot of energy just moving out there. And <laughs> what I wouldn't give to be a fly on the wall and <laughs> see Clifford Shirley Jr.'s, wherever, wherever it is that he is right now, uh, just the conversations that have to be going on behind the scenes. Uh, I listened to a phone call today between BZ and Randy Bean. I, I actually got an email from BZ today, and... Uh, she seems like a really sweet lady. One of the comments that I got uh, on today's video is from Tracy Walter Hensley asking for uh, some immediate help uh, about information regarding UCC law. And it sounds like a jurisdiction question. Uh, hey, Lunacy, love what you're doing. Keep on keeping on the good fight. And please try to cite the law for me about the UCC having precedent over all corporations, statutes, local, federal, and state governments. I really need that law, like super soon, as I am currently creating a lawsuit myself. So here's yet uh, one more person. Well, I don't even know if I want to use the word person. Uh, one more being who is uh, picking up the, the fight and uh, picking up the light, picking up the torch and walking it through the court system and informing them uh, about the, the true state of, wow, their non-existence, I guess, is the best way to put it. So Tracy, I'm going to first start off by saying I am not feeling like I'm 100% clear on this particular facet, but I'm going to show you a couple things uh, that I found. It, it sounds like you're asking for a citation for the Uniform Commercial Code uh, having jurisdiction that trumps that of these uh, district courts. I have no way to validate or verify this right now. I've just found uh, a page that appears to have some citations for you that may or may not help. Uh, please let me know. I'd be interested uh, in how much mileage that you get out of this. Uh, just to highlight a couple things here, it says, and like I say again, I'm just reading what's out here on the internet, so we need to be cautious. Very few Americans know that they have a fundamental choice to live their lives and conduct their businesses under common law jurisdiction or under statutory jurisdiction. Common law is the law of the land and the law of the Constitution. Statutory law is legislated law. And then it cites the IRS making a distinction between the two kinds of law. And the IRS says common law comprises the body of principles and rules of action relating to government and security of persons and property, which derive their authority solely from usages and customs or from judgments and decrees of courts recognizing, affirming, and enforcing such usages and customs. So common law isn't about going and looking at laws that are on the books. Common law is about going to 
the usages and customs from judgments and decrees of courts, recognizing, affirming, and enforcing such usages and customs. Statutory law refers to laws enacted and established by a legislative body, and it cites the IRS manual, a couple sections. Excuse me, I had to shoo the cat. <laughs> she's a sweetheart, but uh, she knows when to act up. I think she's a little bit of a ham. All right. So there's a couple UCC sections that are cited here. Um, the code is complementary to common law, which remains in force except where displaced by the code. Uh, and I believe that's the Uniform Commercial Code. And the Uniform Commercial Code provides the mechanism for making the choice between common law jurisdiction and statutory jurisdiction. It also states that the failure to make the choice results in the loss of common law rights. So silence, silence is consent to uh, what statutory law is what I'm guessing. When a waivable right or claim is involved, the failure to make a reservation thereof causes the loss of right and bars its assertion at a later date. And that's the Uniform Commercial Code 1-207.9. The sufficiency of the reservation, any expression indicating an intention to reserve rights is sufficient, such as, quote, without prejudice, end quote. UCC 1-207.4, that's the old section. Uh, it's now 1-308. So this is an older page that, uh, that hasn't been updated to include that information. So they've got some general case law on jurisdiction down here. So here's some citations. Uh, and I wonder if there isn't someone out there in the Lunacy family listening that uh, would be more plugged into knowing exactly where to point Tracy here. I want to point out that what I was reading in the Praesipe transcript or the Praesipe order that, that Heather wrote and delivered to the court. Let's head over there for a second. Because we've got maxims of law. And I'm not sure at which level or layer of law uh, these are applicable uh, or, or just where they're found, where they're where we find them. But I want to read through them again. Uh, the maxims of law appear to be very foundational. I believe Lotus, uh, oh, I can't remember the rest of her channel name. Um, but Lotus will talk about maxims of law. Maybe she'd be able to, uh, to vector some information to Tracy. But the maximum of Maxim of law number one, nothing can be born from a fraud or deceptive acts and practices, and all such actions are null and void, ab initio. Maxim of law number two, and, and by the way, there's, there's been plenty of fraud and deceptive acts and practices from the corporations that collectively we refer to as the government. Maxims of law number two, jurisdiction is the legal authority to hear, do proceedings, and make discretion, judgment, and order in an action. Maxim of law number three, lack of jurisdiction can be duly declared at any time prior to final disposition 
of an action except in the instance it appears that a perpetrator used fraud or deceptive acts and practices to influence another to believe that they had jurisdiction over them. Then maxims number two and three and four through ten are in force and potentially maxim number one. And so when Heather is asking the court to show them their authority, uh, they're, they're subject to maxim of law number three here. And if they use fraud or deceptive acts to influence another to believe that they had jurisdiction over them, uh, they're, really, they're really violating a lot of maxims of law. And Heather has brought documents from the Uniform Commercial Code, which is the, the body of law. Let's switch back over here to this uh, website that we were reviewing. They derive their authority solely from the usages and customs or from judgments and decrees of courts recognizing, affirming, and enforcing such usages and customs. Okay, that's what the Uniform Commercial Code and all of Heather's filings are. They are the, the decrees of the court recognizing, affirming, and enforcing such usages and customs. And what Heather is doing is bringing all of these documents into the court. She has not been tripped up by any of C. Clifford Shirley's traps, as Randy put them in his phone conversation today, to get Heather to say something to her detriment, which would take her out of this common law jurisdiction and put her under the statutory jurisdiction. Okay, so let's switch back over to the Presepay transcript. Maximum law number four. When lack of jurisdiction is duly declared, the burden of proving jurisdiction shifts to the one who invokes it as proper. Then maxims number six through 10 are in force and potentially maxim number one. So Heather has duly declared a lack of jurisdiction of C. Clifford Shirley and the United States District Court. And according to maxim of law number four, because she has declared a lack of jurisdiction, the burden of proving the jurisdiction shifts to the one who invokes it as proper. And this is some legal ease. And I'm just guessing that the one who invokes it as proper would be the one who is claiming that they have jurisdiction. I'm, that's my feeling on it. I'm, I'm not quite sure if there's somebody out there that can clear up this phrase here. Shifts to the one who invokes it as proper. So in this case, I think it shifts over to C. Clifford Shirley Jr. So he has the burden of proving jurisdiction. So he's got to show and prove basically with documented official paper trail all the way back through all the different layers of law to show and prove that he has jurisdiction. Maximum of law number five, once lack of jurisdiction is duly declared, an alleged court cannot proceed in an alleged action when it clearly appears that the court lacks the required jurisdiction, and any action made by said court is null and void ab initio, or maxim number one is in force. 
And we remember that maxim of law number one, nothing can be born from a fraud or deceptive acts and practices, and all such actions are null and void ab initio. So once lack of jurisdiction is declared and the court, the alleged court is not allowed to proceed when it clearly lacks the jurisdiction, and it clearly lacks the jurisdiction in this case because of all of Heather's UCC filings, which in my understanding, those UCC filings are the usages and customs from judgments or from judgments and decrees of the courts recognizing and affirming and enforcing such usages and customs. Okay, that's, that's exactly what Heather has brought in. So what happened today is Heather has put them on verbal notice. Like she, she wrote this precipe order and let's switch back over to that and submitted this. It was filed on the 29th. And the court, according to Randy, he has a very interesting uh, stack of observations about what he saw and the behavior of the prosecution and the court employees. So Heather's put them on notice that, hey, here's what the maxims of law are. They're foundational. This case, this case clearly is following according to these maxims of law, uh, or Heather is using these maxims of law to her uh, benefit because the court is not allowed to proceed. And if it does... It is committing fraud. Maxim number one is in place. Maxim of law number six, an alleged person or court that appears to lack jurisdiction has no authority to make or hear action or reach merits and determinations, but rather shall forthwith dismiss the alleged action. And in the event of failure to do so, maxim number one is potentially in force. So the court, I believe uh, I remember a 30-day deadline to respond to this precipe. But they, they are not, any, any person or court which appears to lack jurisdiction, which in this case, the U.S. District Court of the Eastern District of Tennessee and a lot of other courts, appear to lack jurisdiction because of this UCC paperwork, which appears to have legal foundational basis. So any person that doesn't have jurisdiction has no authority to make or hear the action or to continue on, and they must dismiss the alleged action. If not, they're liable for maximum of law number one, which is fraud. Maximum of law number seven, when due declaration is made that a person, act, thing is not legal, the burden of proving legality of said person, act, or things shift to the one who invokes it as proper. Then maxims number six and eight through ten are in force and potentially maxim number one. So Heather is declaring that something is not legal or illegal, then the burden of proving the legality shifts to the one who is saying that it is legal. That's very similar to what we saw up here that uh, when a lack of jurisdiction is duly declared, the burden of proving jurisdiction shifts to the one who's saying that they have it. Absent legally 
do sworn verified, or excuse me, this is maximum of law number eight. Absent legally do sworn verified and validated declaration made with due signature of seal of proof of a person, act, thing, or jurisdiction, any alleged action made by such a person, act, or thing as null and void ab initio or maxim number one is in force. So she, she's telling him with maxim of law number eight here that there needs to be a legally due sworn verified and validated declaration made with a signature, the due signature, and a seal, and proof of person, act or thing or jurisdiction. This is a very official document. Verified, validated, including a seal and signature. Any alleged action made by such person, act, or thing is null and void ab initio. So if C. Clifford Shirley Jr. or Deborah C. Poplin any of them are unable to come up with such a document, they can't proceed. When a duly sworn, verified, and validated declaration made with due signature and seal is duly noticed, a due rebuttal shall be made to each specific and particular point made in the due declaration being rebutted. So Heather has filed duly sworn, verified, and validated declarations made with due signature and seal and duly noticed through the Uniform Commercial Code and the courts, the UCC courts. So a due rebuttal shall be made to every one of her specific particular points made in the due declarations that are being rebutted. And there are many line items and many separate filings that all need to be rebutted. And courtesy notices and reminders, several different waves of those go out. And there's several notice uh, grace periods and once it passes its deadline, it's unrebutted. Hey, they, they've got proof of service uh, that the named parties have been notified of these actions through the courts. And they have not responded to them yet. So... A duly sworn, verified, and validated declaration made with due signature and seal, duly unrebutted, specifically and particularly stands as law, is maxim of law number 10. So that's my understanding. I'm not quite sure where the maxims of law come from yet, you know, just which, which layer of law, how foundational or base they are. Uh, I would very much love to hear from the Lunacy family uh, about this, and I'm sure that Tracy would appreciate having this information as well. And I'm not quite sure which, uh, which video this was posted on, but I'm sure you'll find it. That's... Uh, well, actually, we can switch over to that video now. Okay, it's the one where Hat J finds the quartz an additional 46 quintillion. It's the very first one on my page. I'm not sure how, how it looks on your screen. Okay, uh, thank you to everyone who is sending their love, light, and links. I've uh, been getting messages all day long. And, uh, and yeah, this is a pretty exciting time. I'm not quite sure what to think of what happened in the courtroom today. I, I don't have a transcript in front of me, and I've only 
heard two short phone calls uh, that were describing different aspects of it. So it's, I don't feel like I have a clear picture right now, but what does come through is that the courts are confused. The courts are (laughs) unsure of quite what to do. And instead of just having a couple hour recess and reconvening in the afternoon, um, they've sent everyone away until the next hearing date, I guess. They they have 30 days to respond, and I, and I guess they're going to respond in a written format. I don't know that they would call a hearing or anything or, or set a new date to reconvene in the courtroom to announce that, but... Uh, but I'm not quite sure how this works. Uh, I don't know how any of us could be quite sure how it works because it doesn't appear that the people that are involved in the direct flow of this procedure quite know how it works. So we are all learning this in real time. And this is why it's important to stay pending. And you remember that pending means actively in the decision-making process, but not decided. And once you've made a decision, you remove the pend and you depend. And usually the decisions that we make are about the perceptions that we have. And when you depend into a perception, your behavior is altered because behavior roots and grows out of perception. So anything and anyone that seeks to control your perceptions is really seeking to control your behavior. And so there's going to be a lot of theories out there of what's going on But I'm going to let the observations deliver the truth on its own schedule and resist the urge to fill in the void that is left by knowing that everything that I learned about the court systems is wrong. And that's a pretty big void considering the journey that I've taken in life. Okay, keep your love, light, and links coming. If you have any for me, send them to lunacy, L-U-N-A-S-E-E, at protonmail.com. I love you guys a lot. We'll have more when, when we have more information come in. I hope that's real soon. Take good care of yourselves. Be gentle with yourselves. And... Hold a positive vibration and send extra love and light and pray that the souls and beings that are part of the court systems that are actively thinking and considering what their next move is in this case, let them be guided by their true light bodies for their highest and best purpose and the highest and best purposes of all of us involved. Peace out. Good night.